What does a day in the life actually look like working remote IT? My name is Jake. I work remote IT at an MSP, and MSP is a managed service provider, and today I'm gonna to discuss every ticket that I worked on yesterday. There are 14 in total. Okay, so the first ticket that I worked on was a ticket that I have been working on for a couple of weeks now, setting up LAPS, local administrator password solution for a company using Intune. This is a cloud-only company, and I got the policy working. Everything's fine. It's 24 characters, and the internal, after I got it set up, was like, like, I want this to be shorter, make it 16 characters. Um, that's kind of the limit for us. We have to have 16 characters and a sufficiently difficult password. So I'm trying to get these passwords to actually change. I made a new policy with 16 characters. I unassigned the old policy in Intune, assigned the new one. It shows succeeded. If I go on the devices, they show that they have a 16 character password. But when I go in enter on Intune and I look for that local administrator password, it still shows from the original setup date of that original policy. I troubleshot this for like an hour, scouring through my Microsoft documentation, trying to use ChatGPT. I tried to do a remediation script and none of the scripting solutions that I'm making are working. So I'm kind of stuck between a rock and a hard place with this ticket where I'm going to give this guy an ultimatum and say, hey, I can either completely delete the old policy and the new policy, wait a day so that they no longer have admin passwords and then reset it up with the new policy. But this could make this delay a little bit, right? It could mean that we don't have lapsed passwords for like a week because Microsoft takes a long time for this stuff to actually like take effect. Like I'll change a policy it'll take effect the next day. So I'm going to give him that ultimatum or I'm going to say we got to just stay with 24 characters. It's totally up to you until the next password rotation. And then ticket two was also a recurring ticket where I had some devices not getting IPs from DHCP and it was because of a routing issue. We thought an asymmetric routing issue at the edge of the network. So the firewall was forwarding traffic. It makes a connection with the uh, DC, which is the DHCP server. DHCP server sends the traffic back. Firewall sees that return traffic, but sees it over a different public IP and basically basically says, nope, I don't accept this. So no devices actually get IPs. There's an easy short-term fix. You can hop into the firewall and you can run clear con and then the IP of the DC that just clears all the connections with the IP of the DC. However, this isn't a really good long-term solution. This is the second time this has happened and internal is not happy. And I totally understand because multiple times it's throwing their entire bank out of business. I actually have a video about when this first happened. You can see that's either here or here. I forget which side it's on. And then for my third ticket, I had a tier one. I'm a tier two. I had a tier one reach out to me and say, hey, I moved this person to a disabled OU and now the mailbox is gone. What do I do? And so I had to explain how syncing OUs work from Active Directory on-premises, syncing up the cloud. Uh, you need to make sure that you're in an OU in Active Directory that is actually syncing. If you move someone out of a syncing OU, uh, they're going to go away, I believe, unless you make it a shared mailbox first. So I just kind of gave him this information and let him do his own thing. I wasn't going to take a deep dive into it because honestly, it's probably an easy fix. Just move them back to the correct OU if they're going to have a shared mailbox it's, and it still needs to be synced, do that. So I just told him to restore this person and put them where they need to be and he should be good to go. Haven't heard back from him, so I'm gonna assume that that worked. Ticket four was a very common ticket. I had a server with a drive that was full. It was a C drive and the drive was at 95% full, I think. We usually try and keep our drives below 90%. And this is relatively easy. This drive was in our data center, so I had to kind of work with the data center team to get them to provision more space, 20 gigabytes in this case. And then I can hop into the server and just hop into disk management, rescan the disks, right click on that C drive and just extend it. And then you just go through the menu. Next, 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 next. Finish. It extends. We have well over 10%. Good to close the ticket. Ticket five was a wild ticket. It was some VPN issues that, again, a T1 reached out to me for help. I'm thinking this has to do with client-side DNS. All right, I'm just kind of honed in on that. So we're troubleshooting like mad. This VPN splash page, it's URL splash page, will not load. We can ping the VPN by URL. It resolves correctly to the ASA, the firewall's public IP, which is what it's supposed to resolve to. So everything looks good in terms of DNS. We actually had run a, a network reset in there as well. I manually checked the adapter and made sure that everything looked good. I turned off IPv6 because I hate IPv6 and I always turn it off. We're troubleshooting away. It pings, it trace routes, um, but it will not respond to a test net connection over port 443 and it won't respond to curl v on this guy's device. The thing that made this tricky is this guy assured us that the VPN was working for other people. I believed him at the time, but after about 50 minutes of troubleshooting, I've eliminated all client side DNS stuff. I start trying net connection and curl on my device and it's also not working on my device and I'm like there's no way this is working for other people so I made the t1 verify that it was turns out that this guy was wrong it wasn't working for other people and this is a textbook situation of when an end user tells you something take it at face value I should say just take it at face value trust but verify and in this case we wasted 50 minutes of our time because we didn't verify that it was actually working for other people we're looking at connection profiles for other people and all of this type of stuff turns out it was down for everybody it was a p1 uh, network engineer was already working on it and you know it's 
one of those situations where I probably should have just checked the other tickets too. But you tend to listen to people sometimes, especially if it's early in the morning and you haven't had a, enough coffee yet. I'm thinking the root issue was probably a cert on the firewall on the ASA. Okay, next up, I had a P1 whitelist for a CEO. Basically, the CEO was trying to access this PDF embedded in this web page. It was kind of like weird how it was embedded in there. He could access the web page totally fine, totally legitimate page, but the PDF wasn't showing up for him. We do a lot of web filtering because we're a heavily regulated industry and we have granular control over web filtering. I went in, looked at, followed the data and saw that the reason that this was being blocked is because technically it was Adobe file share. So it was like cloud sharing. We generally don't want that to be allowed for people because of data loss prevention. People can share files and also accept files and there could be malware and stuff like that. So that's why we usually block file sharing. And anytime I see like a part of a website being blocked, even if there's no block screen, I know that it probably has to do with something like a CDN, a content delivery network, which is where a lot of websites grab their content. So it's like almost resolving two websites at once or something like this. And so I followed the data. I found that this is what it was. I worked with security services for a one-time exemption because we checked everything. We checked, we could resolve it on our side. We checked the site. We checked the PDF. Everything looked totally fine. Gave her that exemption and we were good to go. That was probably a half an hour. It was an easy P1 only because I knew what I was doing and I know a lot about our web filtering. Okay, my seventh ticket, I had a T1 reach out because they were setting up a lapse, but Windows laps, not with Intune. And they wanted to verify that things are working correctly, that these lapse passwords are actually getting to these devices. So in order to make sure that a lapse password is working for a device, you go to Active Directory, you make sure that advanced features are turned on, uh, you find the device in its proper OU, you click on it, you go to Attribute Editor, and you find this attribute, MS, MCS, Admin Password. If that has a value, the device probably has a lapse password. Now you can't be sure sure because it could just be stale or something's weird, but usually it does. So I did that, verified that. After that, we hopped into this person's device, kind of backstage so they didn't know we were there, and we ran net user. This shows me all the users on that device, even the local ones, and I was able to see a user called administrator. This is the default lapse user. So then I hopped into the device because actually nobody was using this device, and I tried logging in as it. So I went dot backslash administrator. You have to do this dot backslash when you're not using domain creds, when you're logging in locally to the device. Dot backslash administrator, put in the lapse password, and it worked. So I was able to say with pretty dang good confidence, hey, we're logged in under the lapse password. It should be working. Ticket number eight was super easy. I had a tier one reach out because they just don't have permissions to delete devices in Entra in the cloud. And it was just a device decommission. So she needed me to delete it. So I hopped in and I deleted it. Ticket number nine, I had a fellow T2, a fellow sysadmin reach out with an SSL cert that he needed some help with. SSL certs are a secure socket layer. It's used for things like HTTPS, puts that little lock at the top left of your screen. And it also just makes stuff work. If you're gonna serve web content and host it locally, or even host it in the cloud, you probably know about SSL certs because you gotta keep them up to date. So this cert was a wildcard cert, meaning that it would cover any subdomain. So if we have domain.com, it would basically be an asterisk dot domain.com. Anything before that domain.com, this cert would cover. SSL certs have to have private keys bound to them because they use something called public key infrastructure. It's a long, complicated process, but it's super duper important. So if you don't know anything about public key infrastructure, you're going to learn about it on the Security Plus, but I highly recommend that you learn about it for the job as well. I helped him with binding this private key because we had it in a text file. So we use something called OpenSSL to bind this private key to the cert, export it, and then we just uploaded it to the file store, the Azure blob store, where this company keeps their certs. And we were good to go. This was probably 45 minutes. Ticket number 10, I had another sysadmin reach out with help, needing help installing a core software. And this core software is super finicky. Like there's one setting that if you get it wrong, it basically breaks the whole computer. And so you just gotta be careful about it. He reached out in a group chat. I had done it before and I just knew the option that he had to click. So this was a super easy assist, two minutes. Ticket number 11, I had an internal reach out to set up a user, but it was for a contractor and the company's kind of goofy and the internal guy knows me because I'm the system administrator for that account. So he reached out to me. I set up the new user. It was pretty easy. There are some things that I had to check, obviously make sure that his description and organization stuff in AD was correct based off of those contractors. I just copied from another person, another contractor for that company, and then making sure he's in the proper intra groups that's going to give him, if there are any conditional access exclusions, I can't remember, I don't think there are, but there's sometimes a group that will give them that exclusion and then also giving them access to things like SSO for certain apps. So I made sure that all his group stuff was right, that his licensing was the same, and that his Active Directory profile looked good, sent the creds off, good to go. Ticket number 12, I had another P1 for ED 
e-discovery. E-discovery is like tracking down old emails that can't be found in message trace. So I needed to find these emails that were six years old between these two employees and a couple of groups. I started looking into it. Basically, you make this e-discovery case and you put in these parameters for it to search for certain things. And it's searching away. And I'm looking around trying to find the mailboxes for these two girls, but I couldn't find them. So now I'm starting to get worried because I'm like, oh man, this is just going to be a big headache trying to track down all of this stuff and having to, I don't know, maybe pull some users out of uh, the grave and get them back to life in order to find their mailboxes. And, and, you know, I'm looking at all this stuff. When I got about 20 minutes in, a colleague reached out and said, Jake, we're working on the same ticket. And I was like, dude, please take it. I don't want it. I, at this time, I had so much going on. I had uh, this next ticket that I'm going to talk about going on. So he was awesome. He took it. And uh, I never actually got to the bottom of that one. And I don't care. I didn't want to. I had too much going on. So ticket number 13, I had a guy on site tracking down a device that had a bunch of vulnerabilities at a very remote branch. Basically, I had worked with internal, I should say, I had worked with the branch manager because again, this is a remote branch and he had no idea what the device was or how to track it down. The switch was probably eight feet tall in the server rack, in the switch rack. I knew which port it was on. I knew its Mac address. I didn't know where that port went. So we're lining up port labels to the patch panel, lining up patch panel labels to the wall patches. I got, I'm, he's running all around this branch trying to find this wall patch. He finally found the drop that was labeled what we thought it should be. It goes like down underneath this cubby and there's this old dusty device that's got two ethernet cords plugged into it. It's got two NICs. It's got vendor information. It's like a box. We think it's a remote access box for like a vendor, but still nobody had any idea what it was, but we were at least able to take a ton of pictures of it. We think it's actually crucial to the bank's operations and we have vendor contact information. So I'm working with internal IT and I'm working with their primary engineer to track down this vendor, see what's going on and get these vulnerabilities remediated. A big part of my job is making sure that vulnerabilities are remediated. I haven't talked about it a lot today, but we do it all the time. And then my last ticket, I had another colleague reach out about an SSL cert. I'm kind of the SSL cert guy, I guess, because I have a company that does a lot of them. And this was just about binding the cert. So once you have your cert and your private key all ready to like secure things, you have to bind it to these things called listeners in IIS. IIS is a server that might be serving this content. And so we needed to bind it to the port that corresponds to the protocol HTTPS. The S stands for secure. Do you know which port this is? If you guessed 443, you're correct. We went in, I checked over his cert, made sure that it had the private key, made sure that it had all the intermediate chain of authority. Everything looked good. Just clicked on the new one, binded it. We were good to go. That was the end of my day. So 14 total tickets, but some of them were kind of high stress tickets. That was a day in my life. If you want more IT content or career content, feel free to drop me a follow or a like or a comment. All this stuff helps me a ton. Appreciate you guys. Be safe, be smart, make some good decisions. Have a great day.